In 2009, Mark Cavendish was confirmed once again the world's fastest bike rider, with six stage wins on the Tour de France. Cavendish, though, narrowly missing out on the green jersey. Cavendish, who's up? It's Cavendish! Marat's coming at him! Cavendish takes it again! It's very close! It's Cavendish! Who's up? Really good at his teeth! Can he get past Mark Cavendish? No, he can't! Mark Cavendish takes another win! Is anybody going to get Cavendish? It's a win for Cavendish! He'd raised the bar. Now, though, expectations were higher than ever. Mark was coming off a pretty remarkable 2009. You know, been one of the breakthrough riders of the year. Uh, tremendous success that came, in some cases, fairly easily. Coming into 2010, you know, got off on a bad start. Had some, some uh, dental problems, which uh, developed into a serious infection. It screwed up his training at just the wrong time. And then I think he, he struggled. Normally, I go into into the first part of the year and I go to races and races that I'm in good form so I go and I race and I win and this year I was on a back foot so I had to go to races and I tried to try to get fit again I didn't have the winter there again to get fit so it was either stay at home and train or go to races that are harder with mountains or whatever these are races I don't normally do but uh, I wasn't racking up the wins but I wasn't contesting any sprints either so uh, we all knew the goal and the goal worked out pretty well in the end Cavs' first chance in 2010 to contest a major sprint finish came in April in the Tour of Romandy. And the Manxman took not just the win, but also the opportunity to send a message to the doubters. The cannonball was back. Cavendish is the second man in the line here. Then Swift in the black. Danilo Hondo in the pink and blue goes now. Hondo goes around the outside. Hunter's on his wheel. Swift follows in the wheel tracks of Cavendish. Hondo's going up on the left-hand side of Cavendish. Cavi gets right into the wheel. He's in a good position, Danilo Hondo. He's had to take it out for a long way, but he gets it. Mark Cavendish takes victory. At the end of the day, I wasn't trying to be vulgar. You know, I know the, the history of that gesture. And uh, if I want to be vulgar, I'd have stuck a middle finger up. That's internationally known, you know, and... Uh, you know, two fingers is a, there's a, a reason behind it, you know, and uh, but I didn't think it was that offensive, to be honest. And uh, but it, it's ironic, it's the same people that would criticise me, they're the ones that want to see me down with that, you see, they'll do anything. There's, unfortunately, we live in a world of spiteful people, you know, and, uh, and they'll just try and pull you down when they can, and that's part and parcel of it, and well, I'm not going to change for it, you know. After being removed from the Tour of Romandie by his team, HTC Columbia, in the controversy that followed, Mark headed off to the Tour of California for more race practice in May and another stage win. It wasn't long, though, before he was back in the headlines at the Tour de Suisse. Cavendish and Hausler, they both did the same thing. Um, and they both did the right thing in theory. Practically, it ended up in a big disaster. And look at Cavendish, and who's behind him? Yes, Tom Bonin, the Belgian champion. Now it's time to go. Oh, Bo, no, it's not Bonin that makes, uh, makes it, but certainly one of the Lamprey boys has had a big kickoff here. Oh, it's all hell breaking loose as Pataki makes the big push, and Cavendish suddenly comes from nowhere, and he goes for the line. Cavendish hits it early. Oh, and he's down, and he's taken three, four, five riders down with him. Oh, nightmare scenarios that come across the line. Pataki takes it, and I think, wow, you picked the bones out of that. Technically, it, uh, you know, I wasn't in the right, but technically I, I wasn't the only one at fault there, you know. I think if anything, he's more at fault for having his head down in that sprint, you know. It's like, you don't sprint with your head down. You don't ride, it. in Britain you get banned for life for riding a bike with your head down. I didn't slam into him, I didn't hook him, I moved across the road to drift him. If he had his head up, he'd have followed over and, he, and it, it's a block, you know, it, it, it's house sprint. Otherwise we just do time trials for the rest of our lives, you know. Yeah, Housler had his head down and he turns into me, boom. I'm coming across and he hooks into me and that, that sends us flying, so. But I don't complain about this stuff because that's part of what I'm, I'm not scared of rough and tumble. It's, it's not easy and it's, it's, it's not safe and it's not, you know, it's not for the faint-hearted, it, it's sprinting. And that's why I love it and that's what, that's what's appealing to a lot of fans and a lot of people who do it, you know. It's what it's about, that's what, you look at a mountain day, there's 10 guys going for the top win. They can all go the same side of the road and do it. 
You know, you look at a sprint, there's 50 guys all going for the same position, you know, you, you, and there's not enough road for that. And in my head, that's what's exciting, that's what makes it exciting, you know, and uh, it's a war zone in a punch sprint, really is. Many teams and riders were critical of Mark's sprinting tactics, particularly Cervelo Test Team, whose rider, Heinrich Hausler, saw his tour hopes and season end in the crash. The guys from Cervelo said that was a, the whole job was to try and disrupt me for the Tour de France, you know, and those mental games happen, but that's unfortunate, but I've got to take the, the complimentary side of it, that people are willing just to make do anything to try and have me not win, you know. Mark had spent months with controversy never far behind him, but July finally brought the arrival of cycling's biggest and most prestigious event, the Tour de France. The previous year had seen Mark pick up a phenomenal six stage wins, but narrowly miss out on that green jersey of points winner. Taking the Mayo Vert was the big focus this time around. Mark and his HTC Columbia teammates got an opportunity for a sprint win in the very first stage of the 2010 Tour. But on the run into the finish in Brussels, things didn't go according to plan. The first road stage was, was very difficult for the team. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to come out and win the stage. Uh, for me, it was, you know, one of the rare times that I get a chance to go for the stage win. Uh, obviously the plan wasn't uh, to lose Cav, but uh, as it worked out it was a really hectic stage. We, we lost Hanson early on with a crash and you know, he managed to fight back and help us a, li a little bit in the, the finish, which was a credit. We built so much around those first few days of the tour that, you know, we, we weren't expecting success, we were, you know, actually counting on it. Fair looking threatening. Sitting behind the Lamprey boys is uh, next to Alessandro Pataki. The bit of the bouncing of camera here as they come in. Uh, it's actually fairly smooth. Another tight bend. Oh, he's going to run wide. Oh, oh, now a whole load of riders go down. Is that Ferrer? It looks like Ferrer has gone down. Oh, no, 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 no. Surely not. Oscar Ferrer. Is that Cavendish? Oh, who's leaning? Who's going across it? It's Cavendish. Oh, Cavendish le was leaning on uh, Pataki, surely. Uh, as, he t as he tried to make the corner, I don't think it was anything other than he went too hard into it. Frere has gone down. There's Mark Cavendish. It was Cavendish who went down. He just went very hard into the corner, trying to get round, touching off shoulders. But I'm sure there'll be uh, people saying things. I crashed a couple of times in 2010. The thing is, I didn't crash once in 2009, so that's three crashes I had in two years. Because of the high-profile crash, it looks like I crashed a lot. Three crashes in two years is probably the least amount of crashes in a professional peloton, you know? But they're jumped on on, he crashes all the time, you know. I think they keep even calling me pyromaniac in the tour when I crashed, you know. Three times in two years, come on, you know. Under the uh, Flamme Rouge they go, one kilometre to go. It's David Miller on the front, leading out for Tyler Fire. There is a Skyrider in there as well. Here it comes, is that, who's going to go on? Is that Mark Renshaw going for it by himself? Was it Bernard Eisel? Bernard Eisel's taking a big, oh, another crash in the middle, a massive crash. Bernard Eisel's at the front of the group. Tyler Fire's going to try and get something on Huge, huge crash in the middle. Oh, what a finish. Well, we said it was just, it, it was an easy finish. How extraordinary. What a finish. And now pushing towards the front now. It looks like uh, Conor Malovas. It's so difficult to tell. Tyler Farah is lying in third spot at the moment. Pataki is behind him. They managed to stay upright at the moment, are they not? Christian Kane is on the far right hand side. Still, who's going to push for this? Tor Hushoff is the man who must have this. Oh, my word, there's another crash. Tor Hushoff still chasing, still chasing, still chasing. Pataki. And Pataki at the front with Tor Hushoff trying to close him down. Oh, and Robbie McEwen in fourth spot. What a finish. It's uphill, it's uphill all the way. Alessandro Pataki. Cav falling off opened the door for me. Uh, obviously a, a moment that I'll regret for a long time because I probably won't get a chance to win a stage in the Tour de France again and you know to come so so close to, to get next to Pataki and uh, and see the finish line was obviously a, a little bit disappointing but it, it showed that I had good form at that point. For Cav though his green jersey challenge was already off to the worst possible start. After that spring especially that people started to, to doubt him I think it was very important that we say, okay, you know, the team will be there for him. 
or we compromise on everything else, um, on GC ambitions, to support him and hopefully he had that feeling. Three days later, Mark had the chance to make amends on stage four's finishing ramp. We had to do the most of the work in the first week because everybody else said, okay, you guys have Mark Cavendish in the team, so do the work. And what has changed a lot is also teams get more specialized on their trains. It's like Garmin came with a perfect train there, Lamprey before Pitaki, so what we saw. We got caught out a little bit in the, the end of stage four. Um, we used some guys early on. Uh, Tony Martin, you know, we had to use him super early, I think at, you know, four or five K to go, maybe even more. And he's a guy that we need to save at that stage. Uh, so that opened, uh, I suppose, it, it made me pretty vulnerable. Uh, you know, Lamprey had a good team with Hondo and Pataki, and obviously they, they saw that. It's uh, Eisel who's taken up the challenge at the front now. Eisel is the man who's the wingman for Mark Cavendish as they come on this right hand bend. Now, this is the only one that could be a problem. It's wide enough, easily wide enough. They're into the home straight now. Surely this could be Mark Cavendish's day. Finally, he wants to stamp some sort of authority on this. The speed has gone up. It's not super, super high, but it's enough to string them all out. Uh, Torhuzhov, you can see about nine back there in the green jersey. Alessandro Pataki looks in good shape. Oh, Danilo Hondo has it has gone on the far right-hand side. He was looking for where Pataki is. Pataki is going to go up the, through the middle. Uh, Cavendish almost reacted to that. Pataki is still on his wheel. Lloyd Mondori is right behind him. Oscar Freire is in the mix as well. Renshaw still with Mark Cavendish right behind him. I was a little bit uh, open. You know, they went early, which forced me to go early with Cav. Mark Cavendish has still got Renshaw there. He's, uh, you can see Renshaw in the green glasses of HTC Columbia. Garan Thomas is right up the front. He's being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. Oh, it's neck and neck between Cervelo Testing and HTC Columbia. Hushoff, he leans on the elbow. The elbow into the back of uh, Mark Cavendish. Now he's on his wheel. Pataki on the wheel of Tor Hushoff. Rowing the queue and waiting, lurking in there. Julian Dean of, eight, of uh, Garmin Transitions. Chilek is in there with a the fluorescent helmet and the blue jersey. Drive for the line of Boris and Hagen on the right hand side for Sky. Pataki goes. Pataki with the fluorescent bike. He's gone to the front now. Pataki's got it. Robbie McEwen is in his wheel. Can he come out from behind him? Mark Cavendish is beaten. Beaten Cavendish. Now Pataki drives for the line. Is he going to take another one? He does. Alessandro Pataki takes the victory. I thought Robbie McEwen was going to come out from behind him. But the Italian gets delivered to the line. And what a fantastic victory. Mark Cavendish well and truly beaten in Rem. He didn't have it in the legs compared to Alessandro Pataki. Sometimes that just happens. You just don't have the legs. And that day I didn't have the legs. But it was a massive blow, you know. I went to go. The team had been incredible that day. He'd been all down the front, and we'd had a lot of a lot of shit from Cervelo coming into the finish, trying to disrupt our train. Boom, boom! Like their goal, that their again, their goals to try and disrupt us instead of doing their own thing. And uh, the guys put up with that incredible, and then delivering me quite perfect. But uh, I just, I just didn't have it. And uh, and yeah, I could have kept going. Maybe got fearful sick, but it's not my mentality. And okay, maybe I lost the green jersey, and because of it, but. It's not what you think at that point, you know, I wasn't going to win and, and that was that. That stage was probably a big part in, uh, I'd say, in, in Cav's career. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that doubted him at that moment. The press were asking, you know, what are you guys, guys going to do? Are you going to switch it around the sprint for Renshaw or, you know, I mean, it's a given you're not going to give up on Cav. I mean, we, we saw that already a couple of years ago, you know, you never give up on Cav, you know. We kind of give Cav some space, let him know that we're supportive. And then we immediately had to start to think about what we're going to try and do different. What really happened? Let's break it down. Let's look at the films. Let's really see how we change up our game plan. I was having a massage and uh, my one year eldest, he's like, he's the best character in this team in my opinion. And uh, he's been my one year since I was doing the six days in 2005. And uh, he's always great. He, he, he fixes me. and. Uh, and he's great, he always, get, always makes me smile. And Brian Owen came in the room, there's three of us in the room just talking over. And eventually I went from, I went, I went from being really dark and not saying that I was laughing, you know, and, uh, and they're like, I oh, said, so what do we do tomorrow? I said, well, I'll win. I said, you know, I'm not feeling like this again, I'm gonna win. 
If some believed Mark's reign as Sprint King was coming to an end, he duly served them with their answer the very next day. Stage five, from FNA to Montagie. Constantly, Bob kept saying, refocus. Forget about the negativity, forget what happened. What are we gonna do in the situation now? So, you know, we had a couple of riders, new tactics, Mark's not so good. We decided to surf, you know, surf the bunch. Let's not lead out. Let's just have wrench or surf with, with Cav. And, and it worked. And it was the longest stage of the tour that day. It was headwind, it was hot, so hot that day as well. And it seemed to be going uphill the whole day. And we had two guys, no one was riding with us. So it was there. Uh, Two guys riding all day. Oh, and it's a beautiful finish, you know. So they're going to one kilometre to go. It's this nasty left-hander coming up. It really, really narrows as Garmin transitions go uh, for the sprint here. They're trying to lead uh, their man home. Uzoft has got uh, Renshaw on his far out hand side. They're going to have to try and take this one. It's going to be difficult. Oh, they're all going to get through. Very tight. The, the pace gets knocked off immediately. This is what we thought might happen. They have to wind it up again. Who's going to go for this one? Still looking behind. Who's off this is a decent position. Pushing harder. Garmin transitions. I'm not sure that they've got it yet. Renshaw and Matt Who's off? Bumping shoulders. Yeah, we're getting bashed from all sides. Mark Renshaw was phenomenal at the finish. You know, even Oscar Freire was getting in there with Mark. You know, and Oscar never, <laughs> never scraps. And then Tor was giving it to Mark down the down the back straight, like full on, and you don't want Tor Shove leaning on you, you know, and uh, Mark was holding it, holding it, holding it. Will Farrell take this one? Then leave him, leave him open, Julian Dean. He's taking up the charge now, Renshaw in a good position. He looks behind to check the Cavendish is there. Ruzov tries to come through the middle. Cavendish is going for this one on the outside. Chile comes as well. It's Cavendish for the line at the moment. It looks to like, can he hold on? That's the big thing. Edvard Bosenhagen comes at him, but Cavendish is gonna take it. Oh, Cavendish takes the win. That day I gave everything and uh, everybody still gave 100% for me even after what happened the day before and that takes a special group of guys you know and, uh, and finally it's coming together what, what I said was going to happen in the year. We have a lot of pride in the fact that we adapted but I think the, the big pride is seeing the success for Mark. I mean that was so dramatic. That was probably one of the most dramatic days of the whole race. He was just the old Mark Cavendish as we know him and then it was, everybody was really happy for him and everybody was like, okay, and from now on, we race like we raced before. Throwing uh, the helmet out of the, out of the bus and throwing his bike on the ground and the stuff that happened all the, all the year, compared to the day after was a complete contrast. You know, standing, standing on the podium, crying his eyes out was public endearment. You know, the world saw him, embraced him. I went behind and I was just getting shamed and I, I just started crying, you know. And uh, I was behind the podium, I was holding it together, I went to the podium. When I heard the music, it's the familiar music that I know of being on the podium, that, that just hit me again and, uh, and yeah, it was an emotional time. seven grown man give you 150% after you failed them the day before after they give you 150% you know all that stuff combined you know standing the toilet it's for France is the, it's what every cyclist is going up watching you know it, it's just a, it's an incredible feeling you know it's a, you can't I can't put it into words really you know and it wasn't long before Mark was experiencing those emotions all over again. Stage six with another flat finish in Guignol. Under the one kilometre to go, Banner. There's this last corner they have to deal with. It looks like Garmin are in the better position at the moment. Garmin transitions. Take this corner. That could be difficult. 
Through they go. They're still powering on. Julian Dean and Tyler Farah. They've got a big gap at the moment. Is it enough? Through the left-hander here, into the final straight. They swing right again. Garmin Transition have got it sorted out really well. Hondo is the next man in line for Lamprey. Pataki is about five back at the moment. Where is Cavendish? He's got Renshaw. Renshaw's going to muscle his way through. He does. He gets under the wheel of Tyler Farah. Then looks at Robbie Hunter looks over his wheel. He's gone. Renshaw gets to the front. Beautiful timing by Mark Renshaw. Will, will anybody to come through? Tyler Farah digs deep to get under the wheel of Mark Cavendish. Cavendish sprinting the line, Farris coming to his wheel, here comes Pataki, but Cavendish takes two in a row, Cavendish from Farah, and I think from Pataki, my word, that was a fast finish, super, super finish by Mark Cavendish. Jubilation then for Mark Cavendish with two stage wins already under his belt and the prospect of more to come. But as the race headed south, he and his teammates had some unexpected problems to contend with. Throwing him out of the Tour de France was, you know, just too much. Welcome back. So, after a difficult start to the 2010 Tour de France, Mark Cavendish had hit back in style, claiming back-to-back -back stage wins and relaunching his green jersey hopes. The next opportunity for victory came on stage 11, and with it, one of this year's Tour's biggest controversies. I think public looking at the television sees in a completely different light because they haven't been bike riders, they haven't ridden on the track. It did not come across to many people that to say, well, that was um, at least the first two banks have been the right answer to what happened before. Under the Flamme Rouge, one kilometre to go then. At the moment, HTC Columbia look in the best position. Bumping and boring going on between Oscar Freire and Geraint Thomas. Bernard Eisel hits the front. Renshaw looking cool as a cucumber just behind to get off the front. Uh, and uh, power at home for Mark Cavendish. Uh, Tyler Farah muscling his way through Julian Dean. Julian Dean giving the shoulder in. Uh, still Oscar Ferreira waits on Cavendish's wheel. Julian Dean doing a fabulous job to get towards the front. Renshaw now takes it up. Uh, Dean is in front of him. Oh, head to head they go. Renshaw gives him a good battering. Julian Dean knows how to withstand that, but Pataki's on the left-hand side. Danilo Honda launches him off. Here comes Mark Cavendish. He's on the far right-hand side of your screen. Pataki goes for it. He gets into the wheel. Has he gone too early, Mark Cavendish? Uh, Rojas coming in the middle. Cavendish powering for home. I don't think they're going to catch him. Oh, Mark Cavendish takes it. Terrific win for Mark Cavendish. Second is Alessandro Pataki. That was a good old head banging though there from Mark Renshaw and Julian Dean. Indeed there was. Within seconds of the stage finish, the world of cycling was again ablaze with criticism of HCC Columbia's tactics. Cavs lead out man Mark Renshaw removed immediately from the race by tour officials after headbutting Julian Dean three times and, crucially, moving off his line to block the sprint of Cavs' rival, Tyler Farah, taking the Garmin Transitions rider dangerously close to the crash barriers. I will still always be convinced that it was a wrong decision to send Mark home, to even penalise him, you know. I think Mark did the rest thing. Mark's interested to keep upright, you know. Mark did, well, Mark did save the crash. It, the wrong thing is to put your hands over that. That's still, if someone did that to me, what Julian did to Mark, I don't have a problem with that, but I'll, I'll stick my head in, you know, it's the only way you go. If you do that, if Mark takes his hands off the handlebars, the weight's going on the bars when he takes it off, he's going to crash. If Mark let, tries to cut soon away from it, Julian, the weight he has on it, is going to lean into Mark, they're going to crash. The only way to do it is to use your head, it's, it's, it's the only way you can be safe in that, in that, in that situation. He couldn't move and hit him with his shoulder because, again, the bars were too close. So basically the only form he could do is keep his balance with his bars and hit him with his head, so that got him away from him and away from his bars. And then, you know, Dean came back again and sort of banged into him again, gave him another hit, and then he sort of lost his bars. <laughs> hit him with the head the third time, and I sort of thought, oh, no. <laughs> and he said to me that night, you know, after he'd been disqualified, he sort of said, I probably made a mistake that third, I shouldn't have hit him the third time. <laughs> I actually thought it would be okay. I thought there's no way that this is going to get overturned. There's no way Mark can go home. And I, I was convinced of that. And uh, to get back to the room and see Mark's eyes swollen from where he's been crying, I never see that guy cry. 
Uh, it was uh, it was pretty hard to get over. You know, it was an up and down time for me. Uh, the reality that I actually got kicked off the tour probably took a while to sink in. Uh, I still believe that I, you know, the, the headbutts weren't the the cause of the problem. I think the jury combined that with uh, when I moved, I left on Ferrari, which was, you know, not at all uh, deliberate. You know, as soon as he, I saw he was there, or felt he was there, I moved out of his way, and I, I knew I'd done the wrong thing with that move. Um, you know, that was that was the first mistake I've made in three years with uh, a lead out like that. So, uh, hopefully, I won't let it happen again. If Mark blocks Tyler. And Tyler goes and protests after, but he took his hand off the handlebars. It's like, you know, there's so much that happened there that you can't just put on one person. It's not fair. It's it's bike racing, you know, and there's people who did things that were more wrong than Mark, who got away with it. You know, he might have been better off hitting a guy with the wheel than than you know competing at the line. Uh, but you know, that's uh, that's a little bit of the unique thing about the sport. Uh, you know, uh, and I, maybe it's a little bit more like boxing where, or a fight where, you know, the guy who throws the first punch doesn't get in trouble, but the guy who throws the next one, you know, goes to jail. So it's a little bit what happened here. With their number one lead-out man now out of the picture, it was down to HTC's remaining riders to get Cav to the finish a week later in the next sprint opportunity. And what an opportunity it was. Stage 18 into Bordeaux, perhaps the second most prestigious sprint finish anywhere in cycling behind the Champs-Élysées. Mark's rivals, though, sensing the chance to take the advantage. Teams underestimated Mark. They had seen the Mark Cavendish. They had seen the sprint train for a couple of years just blowing away the competition, and they assumed Mark would be more vulnerable than he was. And they actually gave Cavendish the chance to take advantage of the work they were doing in their leads outs. Bernie isn't Mark Renshaw in the lead up. You can't, you can't replace Mark Renshaw in the lead up. But Bernie gave me 110% again. And, uh, we actually, from 1k to go to 300, Bernie's still leading me out, but I wasn't on his wheel, you know? I said, I'd just bring you to in a, in a nice position. I don't know how far I can go, but I'll to 800, 600 meters and just deliver him to a perfect wheel. And the rest is his job, and it worked out. And they go on to the one kilometer to go, Banner. Still the uh, pace is being put on by Sky. Off uh, goes... Uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher at the front, underneath here, will they still be in the same position? Juan Antonio Fletcher is giving everything he can with Geraint Thomas, supremely focused here. The lead out's kind of misunderstood. You see potential guys lined up and think, oh, that's really dominating. They have to be going super fast. They have to go so fast that nobody can come around them and that everybody's working hard to stay with them. If it's anything less than that, it's really easy to take advantage of. Uh, and for really for the first time in many, many races, we were in a position to try and take advantage of somebody else's work, and Mark and Bernie and the team did a good job of that. Edvald Bosenhagen has a real chance now of a sprint victory, but Freire, look at him. He's just lurking behind Bosenhagen on the left-hand side. Joel Hushoft is being brought up by two men. He's been coming up very quickly indeed. Hushoft gets up towards the front. It's the last man off his getting. Jeremy Hunt does a fantastic job. Uh, Cavendish gets over the wheel of Hushoff. He knows who some of the uh, really fast men are. Look at Julian Dean lurking on the, the uh, wheel of Alessandro Pataki. Pataki on the wheel of Cavendish. Hushoff, Cavendish, Pataki. Bosenhagen being squeezed a little bit. In the middle of the shot, they're all on the left-hand side. Belanga's on the right-hand side. They see a little space opening up. Pataki drives for the line now. Still in his wheel, Julian Dean and Mark Cavendish. Hushoff on the left-hand side. Pataki on the right-hand side. Cavendish coming alongside him. Pataki drives the line, but Cavendish, I think, has got this one. Uh, Pataki moves over into the wheel of Mark Cavendish, who is still coming on the right-hand side. It's Cavendish who takes it. When Mark got disqualified, obviously I had to go back to how I used to sprint. It's kind of forgotten now. When I didn't used to have a train, I still won. I, I started my career as just a jumpy sprinter, but I won 80% of the time. I actually had another celebration planned for when I won in Bordeaux and on stage 18. I was going to write Mark Renshaw on my gloves, boom, stick it up like that, but you have to be careful after that, you know. So that's how it is now, and uh, you know, I take a fart and I get disqualified nowadays, so that's how it is. So another great win for Cavendish and HTC, his fourth stage victory of this race, putting him back in with an outside chance at that green jersey, 16 points behind Alessandro Pataki.
And two days later in Paris came the Tour's final and grander sprint finish, the Champs-Élysées, a stage that Cav himself had won the previous year and a prize deemed almost as important as the Maillot Vert itself. No team controls the Champs-Élysées. No team's ever controlled the Champs-Élysées from start to finish, and we do it consistently, you know, it's, it's incredible, you know. And, uh, but a ride of the day came there from Tony Martin, and you don't see it, the camera never shows it. But uh, we came under the tunnel last lap, and I was in like 10th, 11th position. Well, you go down to 70, 80k an hour under the tunnel, then up, and it's one line, it's just like, it's like full gas. And I just, I just hear, hey, Cav, and it's Tony Martin. Tony's come up with this 54-11, and uh, I get on, and he just goes up the side of this train. It's what the peloton's one line here, and uh, he just goes up the side, and then he's, he's moving up more. And I say, no, it's okay, because he could see, I think, six ahead of him, but there's two Cervelo leading out, and then Tor, and then Pataki. And uh, so I think he was going to try and go further, but with three of the same team, they're going to peel off anyway came on the Place de la Concorde and we bed, bed left again. Brings you on the cobbles and the peloton kind of fragments a bit and that's when I jumped in on, on Pataki's wheel and that was it. I knew then from seven minutes to go I was going to win that stage. It's the final corner they're coming into now. It's Cervelo Test Team who are on the front at the moment. The Norwegian champion's jersey looks like it's in second spot. We'll see in just a second. Hushoff goes through with Alessandro Pataki on his wheel. The final lead-off for Andreas Clear by the look of it. It's Andreas Clear with Tor Hushoff in the wheel. I mean, you just watch it on the screen and you don't just know where the finish line might be and you see people sprinting and you're like, Come on, come on, what has to happen now, you know, where are you, where are you, where are you? And then it was basically from the right of the picture to, to the left and going out of the picture more or less. It was just so impressive. Oh, look at Mark Cavendish! That's extraordinary! He's just ridden away, Pataki's trying to get under the wheel of him. He doesn't need anybody! Mark Cavendish does the double top! He gets his fifth! And we were all concentrating on the other two as Pataki began to accelerate to get past Tor Hushoff, but Mark Cavendish came from absolutely nowhere. It wasn't the best win coming. I could have won by further, but I wanted to like win it on my own. So I just turned right and went to the other side of the road. And that side of the Champs Elysees is rough at that section, you know. So I was sprinting on the roughest part of the road, you know, and uh, Think about it, just come past him, I'd have won by further, you know, but I just wanted to, kind of an ego thing, I guess. I just wanted to show the difference, you know, so I went the other side of the road and went, and like I said, you do give 100% on the Champs Elysees because you've got nothing to hold back for. Mark on the podium then as the winner of sprinting's most prestigious stage and free of regrets of what might have been. I said my aim is to go in and win stages and that's how my green jersey comes. Can't, can't do anything about it. Went in with a plan, didn't work, didn't do it. Hold my hands up. <laughs> well, Mark was soon to be wearing the Green Points jersey, but of the Vuelta de España in September. We'll be looking back at what was another tour de force for him and the busy months that followed it after this. Welcome back. 2010 had seen Mark Cavendish court controversy but emerge with another triumphant Tour de France performance. September saw he and his HTC Columbia teammates head to Spain for the Vuelta de España. I was always going to do the Vuelta. Um, never did it before and it's always known as quite a relaxed Grand Tour. It wasn't this year. Everyone who's done it before was like, oh my god, the course, the style of racing was just hard. It was full gas, you know. It was incredible, we went into it, it took me a while to get into the swing of things. Had a completely new team there, like, and, uh, you know, obviously we all got on great, but it takes a while to jam the bike. Cav and company didn't have long to wait for their first test, a spectacular nighttime team time trial in Seville. The team time trial, I learned a lot of this from the academy days with the team pursuit. It's not about four individuals trying to go fast, it's about the collective group getting the best out of that, you know? And if you've got strong guys, weak guys, if your guy, if strong guys go, gives everything, it actually affects the weaker guys and, and it affects the rest of the team, you don't get the recovery. It's about getting the best out of everyone. And then, boom, I went home, I looked at the, the course, I went through on Street View, the whole course, because 
we had like a couple of hours in the morning to prepare on the course to look at it. And uh, I was quite adamant. We went round the first time and a couple of guys talking. And I'm like, no, he talk, we've got to go around and get this, this bits in the road. You've got to be in this part of the road. You talk and we're going back and do it again, you know. A couple of guys were getting a bit pissed off, you know. And uh, well, it's mainly Bernie, but we're like husband and wife anyway, you know. So it was like we ended up having a fight about it and Bernie stormed off at home. <laughs> and, uh, but the other guys were up for it. They, they all stayed and they rode it. And uh, we got the turns perfect. We went out and we did a warm up lap that night, that thing. We did a warm up lap and it was like, it's just supposed to be easy. And we ended up coming in and it's like, hey guys, that was incredible. And it would turn out our warm up lap would have got us fourth in the race as well. Oh, they are quick. There's no doubt about that. Just this little tiny jink to go 14.24 the time they're aiming for and they're going to get inside that. Driving towards the line, they're just tailing people off the back, but I'm not surprised, it's going to be a very fast time. This is the one to beat. 14.06 takes 18 seconds off uh, the fastest time of Milram so far. Another consumer performance uh, by HTC Columbia. In fact, I think I messed it up a little bit. I went a bit early at the end. I had to cross the line first. But I went too early and I ended up dying before the finish, so we would have gone a couple of seconds quicker there. That's the thing, it's an incredible thing. And for me, team time trial, it's the most beautiful part of cycling because everybody gets to share the glory of that. It's a collective group of people doing the things right. The time trial performance brought an unusual side the next day. Mark Cavendish in the red jersey of Welter race leader. Only the second time he'd worn a Grand Tour jersey. Legends of the sport have worn these jerseys, you know, and to, to be able to, to emulate them, it's, it's pretty special, you know. It should be nice to have the yellow one at some point, so we'll try and get that. However, not everything went as planned in the next few days, with successive sprint stages won by Mark's rivals. It wasn't until stage 12, in fact, that HTC got a chance to put things right, with a new lead-out man, Matt Goss, finally making the difference. Matt's not a lead-out guy, he's a sprinter, you know? I mean, there is a difference between following a sprinter and a lead-out guy. Like, Mark Renshaw rides his bike like he rides a tandem, but he trains for that, you know? Goss, he's a sprinter and you have to follow him. But it was narrow roads and everything coming at the finish and there. Uh, and we, we were far back, like, on the, we were, we were on the right-hand side. We came round as a left-hand corner with 1,200 to go. We ended up with 12th position, even further back. And, I, and it's a narrow, narrow road and it was bunching with, and uh, I just thought, well, just gonna have to bowl in now, just gonna have to limit our losses. Uh, no, nobody's wanting to take it up here, and Gilbert has just slipped his way towards the front at the moment. Helicopter shot shows us that we're gonna go to this right hand bend now. This is gonna be the last time, we've gotta be careful. Oh, that's just a, just a little bit of a kink in the middle. This is not the right hand, a 90 degree right hander. You've got to be about position here. And all of a sudden, like, gosh, he just goes, boom. And he's just going really six, seven k now faster than everyone else, like a rocket. And I just get so low. He's so much smaller than Mark as well. Like Mark's got a big arse from the track, you know, and it just shelters me. And uh, we knew it was a tight corner, you know. And he's going faster in this corner, man. So I just backed off. So I was still in this slipstream. He went round it. And he went wide, but I kept the speed and went under. And the others just bottled it. They and looked at the corner. We knew it was steep. They didn't. That's what doing your homework does, you know. Mark Cavendish has got clear air in front of him. He's got miles of a gap. And I shouted at him, like, go on, you take the stage, you know. Because I hadn't done any work for that. We'd won because we were first in the corner, you know, because he'd gone so fast. And then he's like, no, you take it. And by which point they got to come, I've got to go then. So we did that, and, uh, and yeah, so that was quite beautiful. With the first Welter stage under his belt, Mark was back in the Green Points jersey and now had set his sights on a second straight victory. The next day it was an even steeper corner, you know, it was like a, a massive wide road coming into it and so the peloton is just vortexing, you know. It happens that people move out the outside and the guys on the inside get squashed back like a giant vortex. Matteo Tozzato goes up uh, on the right hand side of David Miller, a little bit to his surprise I think. Stauff ahead of Walter Valens here for the quick step uh, team and here comes uh, the uh, Katusha team suddenly sprinting up uh, alongside here. Glazamani off the uh, Russian time trial champion had a very good run in yesterday. Here's this Ben, what's going to happen? Who's going to go down? 
and we come up to the right hand corner and the peloton's gone left and Gossie just dived right and I dived with him. We went and we'd looked at this on Street View as well in the morning, you know, and uh, and we dived right and we came into the corner and then Pozzato was leaning out his man and we knew we just had to take it tight and we practically skidded around it, you know. And Pozzato went out and he was going to go for it, but we knew it was tight. He came and then Gossie just went and it was like, I, I was screaming, ah! Like, he was like, it was incredible fast. It, I'm sure that his part was faster than my sprint. Goss accelerates as hard as he can. He's got Cavendish, the green jersey, right behind him. Who's off behind that? Then Bernati. Tor said after, he's like, never, ever losing anything that fast, but it was incredible. And uh, yeah, so I just went 200 metres, and again, I didn't do the work. Goss did the work. Away goes Mark Cavendish. Cavendish out of the saddle. Who's off this charging as hard as he can? He's not going to get it. Cavendish is going to get a second. And in the end, it was easy. Bunny hops over the line. Cavendish had the acceleration, but the turn of speed put on by Matt Goss made everybody suffer behind. I did a little bunny hop over the finish line that day, so uh, I don't know. I think uh, the sponsor could get something out of it. You know, it wasn't really the video I was after, it was about the photos, you know. Classic headline grabbing stuff from Cav, and he backed his antics up with another win on stage 18. Matt Goss is still fighting now to keep a wheel here of uh, the quick step boys. It's Matteo Tozzato is doing a, a very, very fast job, and Goss is fighting to get to that wheel. That's going to take a lot of energy. He's got there almost. But uh, Wayland is, uh, is yells, he says, Wayland is basically saying, slow down, slow down, slow down, because uh, I think he was being... Too far off, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, his teammate pulling, you know, just uh, really, really strong, and it's playing into HTC here with, uh, you know, the HTC, HTC riders uh, in second and tall position with Cavendish. Yep, Goss finds a little gap, goes through... Uh, into the middle of the uh, our shot there. Goss strikes for home now. Bernati's on the far right side. He's out of it. He's not doing anything. Kutorovic comes around the outside. Uh, it looks like uh, Hado is it? In uh, third spot at the moment, who's following the wheel of Mark Cavendish. He's well placed, but Cavendish is very fast. Hado comes around the outside of him. Can Hado steal the thunder? Oh, he's going very hard at it. Uh, Cavendish is just about going to get it. Now Mark was on course to take his first ever Grand Tour jersey as the peloton descended on the Spanish capital for the Grand Finale in Madrid. We're almost there, almost the end of this uh, year's Vuelta de España with the big showdown, big sprint showdown between Tyler Farah and uh, Mark Cavendish shaping up here. Like the last day, we going to sprint and we we're pretty confident that we we're going to win that sprint. There were like 3k to go, come around the corner here, ding! And, I, and all of a sudden I'm like pushing 50% more watts. Mm, mm, mm. First shot it punctured, then I was like, and my wheels pulled. And the ding ding, oh, my, I've the spoke snapped. Now uh, I'm like, oh, and I, normally I pull out, shout, Gossy, you, you go for the sprint. And I'm like, and I have to finish in the top four if Ferrar wins the stage. And I was like, Oh, so I'm going, and I was in the red, and I was on the limit, like full gas sprint in the last 2k, and, uh, and it was just about limit my losses to finish, trying to stay on Gossie as much as possible, because as soon as I get in the wind with that, I'm going to have to push maximum what's left for 1600, and I can't do that for longer than a couple of seconds. Running under the kilometre to go, uh, kite then, one kilometre, as uh, the lead out goes here. And uh, the last man you can see here is Nicholas Mace here. Robert Forster just behind him. Mace is the last man, looks over his shoulder, but he's got Forster uh, in his wheel. Behind that looks like Sebastianino. Uh, then Daniele Bernati. Where is Mark Cavendish at this point? Seems to, he's just lurking behind Matt Goss. There you can see Forster in the wheel of uh, Nicholas Mace. Uh, Sebastianino can't do it. Uh, Goss is still waiting, waiting, waiting. It's the wrong position for uh, Forster to be in because he's having to lead it out here. Uh, Cavendish in the perfect position at the moment. And uh, nobody seems to be close to him at the moment as Goss goes hard for it at the front. And uh, oh, I had to go. And, uh, and yeah, I was able to hang on, I think, at fourth. So I, I made the. Uh, did I get, no, I got second. And, uh, <laughs> With Samuel Dumoulin getting in the wheel, there's nobody's going to get past. Uh, or is there? Is Gregor Bowler going for the sprint here? Cavendish looks across. Everybody's. Uh, 
They're looking at Mark Cavendish as Tyler Farah comes through and takes the win from nowhere. And yes, I got the green, so I was really happy. It was pretty incredible, you know. Uh, didn't expect to, didn't plan on it. From going, didn't even think about it. It was an incredibly successful world cup. A fantastic result for Mark, and one that left him eager for more glory soon after at the World Championships, held just a few weeks later in Australia on a long, flat course that looked ideal for his capabilities. Yeah, when I looked at the video of the, the World's course earlier in the year, I saw the profile went through it with my trainer, and uh, I mean, you know how many laps was around there? It was like, well, I can win this. <laughs> you know, that's not too hard. They're, they're not climbs, they're, they're punches, you know. There's no reason why we can't do this, but uh, that's why I went into the welter and I was like, you know, I just want to lose weight here, that's it. I just need to lose weight, I need to get fit from this. I just went too deep there. And after I went too deep, I was so focused on the world. If you look Tor and Freire, they all pulled out in the first two weeks. It was such a hard welter. They pulled out and they rested up. Now I finished the welter, I was tired. For the next day to Australia, and then now I just wish I'd listened, like, as with Jez and as with Dave, and Bernie was coming out training with us, and all of them were saying, just calm down. I was going out, I was training harder, longer, faster. I was just, like, so scared to, to lose form. I had incredible form come out the welter, and I was, like, so scared to lose that form. And then they kept saying, like, take it easy, take it easy, take it easy. And, I knew it, like, as we started the, the race and we went over the Melbourne Bridge and directly over the Melbourne Bridge. I was like, I knew it, I felt fatigue in my legs, I was like, I messed up here. And, uh, but I spoke to the guys and we were like, we just give everything, we've got three guys here, we, we represent the country and we're going to give everything we have. And them guys gave everything for me and I gave everything at the end, but, yeah, it can only last till five to go, really. Gusev takes on the, the mantle of leading this. They've gone under the one kilometer to go. Uh, Banner, they're going to turn hard uh, right now into this final. The three have been caught. It's a Japan at the front at the moment. Is it not, by the look of it? Trying to lead things out. Or is it Denmark? Denmark. Oh, Terpstra drives for the line. He's one last bid to try and stay away. That's a smart move by Nicky Terpstra because he can't uh, he can't out sprint people, but he might be able to out drag them. He's trying to do a cancellara. In the middle of the shot is Hushoff uh, is there. Hushoff uh, to the far right hand side. Van Evermart in the yellow helmet for Belgium. Uh, on his wheel is Matti Bretschel in the white glasses, the red and white of. Uh, uh, Denmark on the left hand side, Philippe Gilbert is still up towards the front and on his, on his wheel is Oscar Freire. Oscar Freire has made it here and Alan Davis of Australia gets into the wheel of Matty Bretsch. On the right hand side is Hujov. Hujov makes the win. When he came out from behind everybody had a completely clear run. The big Norwegian used his strength that he had clear air, had nobody in front of him, nobody to get in the way, and Tor Hujoft is the world champion. It's a big, big lesson learned, you know, and uh, the turn back time he would, but I've learned the lessons for next time, and, uh, and I won't let that happen again, I don't think so. Disappointment then down under, but Mark's season still wasn't over. Another prestigious occasion awaited, the Commonwealth Games. Mark in Delhi riding alongside many of the lads he'd grown up with in an Isle of Man team that featured, uniquely, an electrician and a postman. To ride the Commonwealth Games the Isle of Man was incredible. It's like, they're just a group of guys who are just my friends. They're the guys I grew up riding with as when I was younger, you know, and just going out and just just messing around on your bikes, you know. I've always got a bond with them guys, and uh, all of them were amateurs who went. Normally they go to the Commonwealth Games, the Isle of Man, and it's like, oh, there's big boys here from Australia. Like, they're just happy to be there. What they're it's the first time. They've been training four years for that. I don't see why you should train for four years and not have a purpose at that race. You know, it's, it's kind of like, to give them a purpose, gave them something what they worked for, you know, and uh, and they rode incredible for me, you know. When I was in that break, I knew I couldn't win the Commonwealth Games with two riders from three nations, but the guys had ridden more than anyone, more than the Aussies. There was six pros there from the Aussies. 
and my guys had ridden more than them. You know, I had to just go till I died. I had to give everything in there. We and I just wasn't strong enough there, you know, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun doing it. I was exhausted, but the Manxies, you know, and uh, I just loved being around them, you know, it's just so much fun. And uh, so I just wanted to stay longer, and that was it. It had been a long and tiring 2010, but one that had left a smile on Cavendish's face. With the Manxman confirmed once more as the fastest sprinter in the sport, what targets does he set for the next campaign? Be in for the green jersey again. Be in for the World Championships again. Be in for the, the minute we aim for San Remo again. Be in to win. Every bike race I can win, I want to win. Every bike race I can win, my team will, will work 100%, we'll try and win. And that's, that's how it's always going to be. Bad news for his rivals then. At just 25 years of age, Mark Cavendish already has an incredible palmares. 15 Tour de France stage wins another five stages at the Giro d'Italia and three more and the points jersey at the Vuelta de España. All of that plus a Milan San Remo victory and two gold medals at the Track World Championships. Cavendish has made the world of sprinting his own. Not that there aren't some things though but still get his goat. The question I get asked most do you want to do more in cycling? Of course I do. You know what do you think I like starting a race sitting there while People attack, usually the French, attacking. For, they don't know why they're attacking. They just do it because they're hearing it in the radios, you know? Doo -doo -doo. Little break goes. My team get on the front. I sit there, seventh position, ride the whole day, get bashed by Torshov, and then sprint at the end. You, that, that's not what I did when I was a kid. You know, that's not what I love about bike racing. But I'm a professional bike racer. It's not a fing hobby. All the champions, you know, they're all a little bit mental, really. <laughs> they're all kind of like a, a few chips off the old block, you know. And they're, you know, they're very volatile and Cav, Cav's like that, you know. He, 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 up there on the podium crying, eyes, crying his eyes out, you know, because he won a stage. But the thing is, you know, that, that fire's really there and, um, you know, we believe in that. Well, you should never give up on him. I mean, that's, that's clear to say, well, he does have the talent. Mm. He needs to get his things together. And sometimes they have the feeling, uh, it would be nice if he could be a little earlier. <laughs> you know, that you just like, okay, fine, it's all done, it's all. And you have to wait for that in other words. You have to give him the chance to, to prove it when he needs to prove it. He was in a difficult situation. And luckily, the team around him was pretty strong to not to lead all that pressure still on his uh, shoulders, Le leave it on his shoulders, just spread it out over the whole team and have 16 bike riders winning races. I'm proud of the people around me though, you know. Um, when things aren't going my way, I'm not the easiest to work with. And then people stuck by me, you know, and, and that's a special thing, you know, I'm very, very lucky for that. And, uh, and I'll always treasure that actually, you know. I learned a lot this year. A lot of things went on in private life, a lot of things went on in public life, but um, I learned a hell of a lot about myself in my private life and my professional life. And uh, in a way, it's a good thing. Kind of bad things happen. I still had a successful year, but bad things happened. And, uh, and you learn who your real friends are. You learn who, who the people are who, who really care about you as well. And, uh, and that's a great thing that I'll take away from it. So. Run fast for your mother, run fast. Cool. I'll have to cut that bit. Yeah. <laughs>